tanks have heated up, a man starts avalanches with explosives. A hundred meters down, an extreme diver recovers coral. And Fire. a master blaster shows us his best trick. Which of these jobs is the easiest to get into? an avalanche, coming to you at speeds of over 200 kilometers per hour. You've got to hike all day, with 30 kilos of camera equipment on your back, and risk being buried alive every time you set off the world. British Columbia, Canada. Steve Crochet earns around 100,000 euros a year as one of the world's only full-time avalanche cameramen. What makes someone do this? Once I'm out there, I'm so alive, so vibrant at that moment that I have no time for fear. Steve is an award-winning filmmaker. His commute takes him from home in Alaska to Revelstoke, British Columbia where he knows the conditions are likely to be good. He needs mountains with thousands of kilos of dry snow. An area where there are no people, and it's an extremely reliable pit. His is virtually bombproof. This old World War II Airflex 2C camera has seen more avalanches than war. And it's been reliable. It's my little friend. I call him Skippy 1 and Skippy 2. I got two cameras I use for crash box. Skippy. The crash box is a protective case weighing 30 kilos. It has to be reinforced because of the massive pressures inside an avalanche. Foam padding will shield the cameras from around 10 tons of impact. The cameras may not be crushed, what is the risk assessment for Steve like? At the first sight of blue sky, Steve charters a helicopter in search of a promising avalanche site. Over the years, he's taught himself how to read the landscape. Every mountain has a different way of expressing itself. And what I try to search for on a mountain is cliffs and ledges and contours and features on that mountain when I study it to see where the snow will go and really dance. All sounds very zen. But there's some real science to this. Meteorology for starters. The weather is often against him. Thousands of dollars on Visa credit card again today for me if we leave now. And now if and then if I see it clearing off, I'll just... No, I'll, I think I, we should stay because sometimes it does clear off of just day. towards towards evening. Yeah. So it's worth a shot. Ever the optimist, Steve sets off on a five kilometer hike to find the perfect camera angle. But it's no good. It's not gonna work. We're gonna pull the plug. No, it's one of those days where I, 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 it's, I just tell myself I'm not gonna go out unless it's absolutely blue sky. And it was not absolutely blue, but I thought, you know, I just thought it was gonna be good, but oh, I got skunked. I got lured in. The gamble proved expensive. Time to retreat, scan the weather reports again. You can't afford to fail a second time. I have to wait for bright sunny days to shoot an avalanche because the light has to be perfect. Otherwise, it's just a waste of money and time. I'm never bored or unhappy. As a matter of fact, I've learned to relax because of the unpredictable weather in Revelstoke. What else am I going to do? So, you know, patience, patience. You know, it's always about patience. 
The next day, a high pressure zone is forecast. So Steve rolls the dice again, risking everything for the perfect shot. It's now or never. It's looking like a really good day. I'm very excited. Only a three hour trip, loaded up with around 10 kilos of dynamite. This is the really skillful bit. Steve and his explosives expert plot where and when the detonations need to go. No prizes for second place in this game. Yeah, that knows. Okay, just go off. Uh, your furthest bomb would be off to... to uh... Just stop. Avalanches are unpredictable forces of nature and one can never become complacent around them. So we take every precaution where there's a person to be in a safe zone. Steve is now in a very dangerous spot. The rotor blades of the helicopter could trigger the avalanche to start too soon. He quickly primes the crash box camera with a timer, synchronized to start a moment before the detonations. Now I'm going to take my little eyepiece out here and just check my shot. Oh, it's beautiful. I think it's gonna be a big one. Tons and tons of snow are gonna hit this box and take it 50 feet, maybe 600 yards, maybe even further. It's hard to say. My fingers are frozen. I'm getting cold. I gotta get out of here, I'm nervous too. This slope is very dangerous. Camera one set. Steve goes to his position. He'll remain here with the other camera for the duration of the shoot too far away and he'll miss the shot. Too near and he could end up dead. He gives the go yeah, ahead to the detonation. John, uh, if you could go a little bit more to the right in that one pocket there. That's uh, one minute, 50 seconds on the timer, so. Oh, that's a thrill. When those bombs go off and I see uh, there's a slight pause, nothing happens and then the entire mountain rips out. There has been no experience in my life that's come close to that. I mean, really, nothing. The explosives are in place. The area is cleared. Time for countdown. The dynamite works, but will the dislodged snow be enough to form the avalanche Steve wants? said that I'm creating hell, but all I'm doing is merely giving nature a little push to show it in its best light. Man-made or not, the results speak for themselves. <laughs> Footage like this can be worth around 6,000 euros per cut, a price tag worth dying for. Steve makes it all look easy. If all it took was a camera and some snow, everyone would be doing that. Still to come, master blasting on an even bigger scale. But first, how about this for a job description? Burst eardrums, paralysis, Oh, and uh, death, a distinct possibility. Diving off the coast of Sardinia in Italy sounds like a vacation, but this is a job for the deadly serious. The commute is great, but the work is gruelling. Hours of preparation are needed for just five minutes of work. Andreino Shirko is a red coral hunter. A family tradition that sometimes plays in nothing. And he works in extreme darkness, extreme cold, and under extreme pressure. The sea is dark, almost black, and I can't see the bottom. I certainly know what to do, but the smallest mistake could cost me my life. Andrei, 
Red Crawl is red. Over exploitation often forces Andrew Winter to die in the He's currently trained for a dive to 100 meters, which is reaching the upper limit of human tolerance. His crew, Tomasino and Marco, has the job of checking every single piece of dive equipment. Equipment failure can force divers to surface too quickly, resulting in decompression sickness, where nitrogen bubbles form in the blood and can damage the body's internal tissues. Air bottles safely loaded, Andreino sets off. His cheerful appearance belies the tension that's building before this dive, especially for Sabrina, his wife. Sabrina isn't very happy with my job. I understand, Theone, but now we're not alone anymore. We're expecting a baby, and I would prefer him to stay at home. I would be less worried. I took on the coral diving with my brother, who learnt it from our grandfather. It's a family tradition. We're not destroying anything because we only knock off single pieces, so that our descendants will still enjoy the red coral. They have to keep looking for new territory, where the coral hasn't yet been overexploited. Today, they are heading out to what for them is uncharted waters. Andreino knows that in his job description, the sea is quick to punish his mistakes, sometimes with fatal consequences. Depths of 100 meters. Nitrogen narcosis can make you lose your mind and send you into a deadly sleep. Or, if you're lucky, you'll only be blinded. If you thought diving into the big blue was a glamorous profession, think again. Andreino breathes Trimix, an expensive gas cocktail where helium is added to the standard mixture of oxygen and nitrogen. The helium makes it safer at extreme depths because less nitrogen will be absorbed into the bloodstream. Even so, he must find the coral quickly. The red coral is something special. There's something magical about it. I'm drawn to it. Greatly prized by jewelers, red coral is valued at around 700 euros a kilo. Andreino has struck it lucky, but the clock is ticking. He can only stay down here for five minutes. Any longer can kill him. Just like fool's gold, there are similar corals that look like true red coral, but are worthless mimics. Part of the job is spotting the fakes. Overexploitation has seen red coral disappear from many places along our coastlines. In the Mediterranean, 70 tons are collected annually. Andreino is just one of a few Sardinian divers licensed by the government to harvest small amounts each year. After five or six minutes, I have to go up again. But very slowly, having gone up to 50 meters, I send the red coral up my balloon. Now comes the most critical stage.
and Raina risks paralysis, joints and nerves are damaged, and even death from an embolism. To counteract this, he must stop three times on his way up and wait. It took one and a half minutes to descend, and it will take three hours before he can emerge. With the aid of a notepad, he can communicate with his team, but the water zaps heat from the body, and even in warm water, he becomes exhausted. On days when he fails to find coral, his return trip is terrible. The last stage is the most dangerous. That's when I'm at three meters. It's the most dangerous because I have to stay there for the longest time, and I'm fighting against the current and the cold. At last, he emerges and gives the signal that he's okay. It doesn't look like much, but just this small amount collected today will fetch several hundred euros. Even so, it's a small reward for the danger involved. Before you sign up, you'd better get some training in how to minimise risk. Especially if you're planning on a career blowing up big buildings. Over in Florida, is a man whose job it is to do just that. Steve Pettigrew graduated with a degree in business administration. A far cry from his current job as demolition supervisor. can earn around 200,000 euros a year as a master master. His next project will be one of his hardest, the Jacksonville Coliseum. This is a, an arena which means it's not a typical column beam structure with interior floors. It's basically about 98% here. Steve has developed his skills over 27 years by bringing down some of the biggest buildings in the USA. Then when you get to the halfway point, you gotta, you gotta start back again. Even though he's made of steel, stupid, carried by huge columns of concrete. You always start from the start. He knows it'll be difficult to collapse. Get your thing, especially in the building where you got a lot of different delays. Steve's hand-picked team has to research every angle. Five weeks ago, we went down to the archives down in the city hall, and we, we have received the old blueprints, the structural drawings. So based on that information, then we determined that we, we could shoot the roof and 90% of the structure. Tremendous accomplishment when you see your homework. And it's just not the two weeks we're on the job or three days of loading. This is 27 years of experience applied to that one shot, so, and there's a saying, you're only as good as your last shot. No pressure then, and to make the job even harder, there's a major complication. Just two metres from the dome, a 20 metre long monument serves as a tribute to more than 1,500 local war heroes. Such a sacred site must be protected from all those high explosives. We have 275 pounds in the structure at 410 holes. It travels down here, then it stops a quarter of a second. And like the E cord or detonating cord, it goes to these tubes and it goes and it stops in those in-hole delays and it'll start, it stop at four, well this one is 4.4 seconds. Steve needs to know how the blasts work, but he also needs a specialized team. Meet Brent Blanchard. 
Are we still online here? Brent put seismic readers around the building, making sure the explosions stay within safety limits. Right here. Uh. All right, that's on our feet. Good. How are the uh, seismographs looking? Are they, did you, were you able to put those two back in the zone where you wanted them? Okay, sounds great. Good, why, why don't I check back in in about a half hour or so? Police cordon off the entire area. The moment of truth approaches. Detonation box is primed and cameras are set. In the event of a mistake, Brent will need objective data. Our material is often used to prove performance. It doesn't always go 100% perfect every time, but if we have done our job correctly, everyone will know if there was damage. How much? How do we get this fixed quickly? Hi, Steve. How are you? All right, good, good. I guess we're on we're on schedule. We might shoot early. No problem. I, that's why I was calling you. Earl's completely out of the zone. We're all clear. Everything's running. All right, thank you. Good luck. Talk soon. These final moments of preparation are the worst for any demolition team. Even a professional like Steve gets butterflies. As soon as they're clear, we'll start at two minutes. Then. Okay, everybody, you want, you know, we make sure it's besides Steven and uh, Jeff. Everybody's going behind the car over here. Here we go. Count 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, fire. of the detonations and gravity brings the roof down. Very nice. 123 kilos of explosives and loaded the structure exactly as planned. Looked very good. That was fast. That's the that's the thing with the concrete structure and stuff. You see the memorial wall is coming into view. The dust just blows you out so quickly. Right now we'll just wait for the dust to clear and we'll see. That looks good. For Steve, it's a reminder of what people can achieve. I, I look of the people who have been in it, but the workers have built it, you know, because it is man-made. A man put it up, a man's going to take it down. It's a precision job. A huge building reduced to rubble, without so much as a scratch on the precious memorial. is an extreme lifestyle and with around 25 years of training master blasting is practically a life sentence as for avalanche photography looks easy enough who does it with explosives. A hundred meters down, an extreme diver recovers coral. And Fire. a master blaster shows us his best trick. Which of these jobs is the easiest to get into? Someone 
do this? Once I'm out there, I'm so alive, so vibrant at that moment that I have no time for fear. Steve is an award-winning filmmaker. His commute takes him from home in Alaska to Revelstoke, British Columbia, where he knows the conditions are likely to be good. He needs mountains with thousands of kilos of dry snow, an area where there are no people, and some extremely reliable kit. His is virtually new. You need to put yourself in the path of an avalanche, coming to you at speeds of over 200 kilometers per hour. You've got to hike all day with 30 kilos of camera equipment on your back and risk being buried alive every time you set off for work. British Columbia, Canada. Steve Crochet earns around 100,000 euros a year as one of the world's only full-time avalanche cameramen. The cameras may not be crushed. What is the risk assessment for Steve like? At the first sight of blue sky, Steve charters a helicopter in search of a promising avalanche site. Over the years, he's taught himself how to read the landscape. Every mountain has a different way of expressing itself, and what I try to search for on a mountain... Bump. This old World War II Airflex 2C camera has seen more avalanches than war. And it's been reliable. It's my little friend. I call him Skippy 1 and Skippy 2. I got two cameras I use for crash box. Skippy. The crash box is a protective case weighing 30 kilos. It has to be reinforced because of the massive pressures inside an avalanche. Foam padding will shield the cameras from around 10 tons of impact. 